Uh, you'll notice uh, the title, title of my message is going to be a little bit different, although I was initially going to be preaching on this, no manna, no quail, no pillar, no cloud, now what? And as I've been, as I've been reading through the book of Joshua, I keep going back to chapter 1 and reading again because there's so much there for direct application to our spiritual walk. You know, the God showed me the other day something I hadn't seen before. You remember when they crossed the River Jordan, when the river was parted miraculously? And uh, there were altars that were set up. Remember that Joshua had them gather stones? Each Israelite gathered stones. Well, did you know that there were actually two altars set up? They set up a, an altar on the other side of the Jordan after they crossed miraculously. But there was also, remember, where else was there an altar? See if anybody's paying attention. In the middle. In the middle of what? In the middle of the Jordan River. In the midst of the, you know, the raging waters. After they crossed over, the, the waters came back over. So there was a... There's an altar on the other side that they could see, but there's, there was also an altar that could not be seen under the water in the middle of the river. Now, all of the things in Joshua, everything that was true for, for Israel historically is true for us what? Spiritually, there is a significance. Now, what, which of the two altars do you think has a significance for us as the people of God? One under, the one over, both, or all of the above? Both, all of the above. They both are significant. They both are significant. Because we're a people that are crossing over. But we're also a people who are in the river. In the river. What's the river? What is the river? What is that water of the Jordan representative of? I believe it's representative, and I talked about many meanings. You know, the, the Scriptures are so amazing. You know, the more, the more I study the Scripture, and I, I know now why God had me delay this. This is really, I'm going to put you right in the right, keep that testimony in mind. God's bigger than our memory. God's bigger than my memory. I'm still taking those memory pills, by the way. And, and, um, and I still have my, my forgetfulness t-shirt in my office to remember my forgetfulness. Let me rabbit trail for a second. It's really funny. The other day I went to pick up a friend that was coming in from Venezuela. And I had talked to this young person by phone the day before. And uh, I said to her, I don't know what you look like, but do you have any description of me? And uh, she says, yeah, somebody described, you know, the... The pastor's daughter, Pastor Lionel's daughter, described you. So I'll be able to find you, don't worry. So um, on, um, on Friday, I'm at the airport. Friday afternoon, I'm at the airport. You know, this is speaking of uh, memory loss, old age, and all that wonderful stuff. Friday, I'm at the airport, and the flight's arrived, and everybody's coming out, and I'm looking for this person. I had no idea what she looked like. I knew that she would be a single uh, woman, you know, by herself, uh, early 20s, and... Uh, carrying, you know, bags with her. It's, it's, so I'm kind of looking around, and I see everybody kind of receiving their friends, and I don't see this person yet. I'm getting a little bit nervous. And finally, I, I look at this girl. She's looking around. She's looking right by me. And I think, I, it can't be her because she's got a description of me, and she just saw me. Then I see a file folder, and it says, Raphael, and, you know, with my bad eyesight, I make out the, the you know, vague outline of my phone number. So I come, this has got to be her. And so I come up to her and I said, Valentina? And she goes, oh, Raphael. And I go, yeah, it's me. It's me. And she had been kind of looking down, you know, lower than where I was. And, uh, and I said, well, I guess you, you didn't recognize me. And she said, no, um, the pastor's daughter said to look for somebody short, fat, and bald. So I told her, well, at least you got two out of the three. Two out of three ain't bad. 
That's a pretty good batting average in baseball. And shorter than her. Right. So I'll have to call the pastor's daughter and tell her I've had amazing and miraculous growth of hair and stature, <laughs> so forth. But we're, we're a people that are living in the river, in the river, the flow of the Holy Spirit, of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We're also a people that has crossed over, if you're a follower in Jesus Christ. There's so many wonderful things in, uh, in this book um, that, uh, that God was, had, was revealing to me this week. And, and, so, and I, I, so I want to come back. You know, I, in, my, in my Monday morning blues letter, I talked to you a little bit about, I expanded on this issue of the devoted things. What, what are those devoted things in chapter 7? In some of your translations, it says un, things under the, the ban. In, I think in the King James or in the, in the New American Standard, it says that they took the things that were under the ban. Now, this is something significant. All Scripture is significant. There is never anything that we can just sort of gloss over and, uh, and leave behind too quickly. Um, now, Joshua is an amazing and powerful prophetic picture of your life in Christ. And so I encourage you not just to read it, but to internalize it and meditate on it. Um, God will speak to you in, in incredible ways. I want you to turn. Let, keep your finger on Joshua 7, because we'll come back to it. 1 Corinthians 10. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 10. 1. Um, Paul, um, speaking to the church at Corinth, about some things in Israel's history. And he says, for I don't, you, you guys with me? For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And notice this, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and what? And in the sea. And this is representative of our own exodus. When we, when we come to Christ, the, the picture uh, in the Old Testament is a picture, it's similar to the nation of Israel crossing the Red Sea, the Red Sea, or the Sea of Blood. And so there's a picture of redemption. Jesus leads us all out of bondage to sin and slavery into redemption. And so we all experience that. And he goes on and he says, they all ate of the same spiritual food, verse 3 and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was, was Christ. That rock was Christ. Now, you remember Moses, Aaron, and Eleazar, the priest, neither of them were able to enter into the land because when they were told to, to speak to the rock, what did they do? They struck the rock. They struck the rock. Now, Moses didn't go into the promised land, but it doesn't mean that he didn't go to heaven. The promised land and heaven are two different things. Moses and Aaron, I'm sure one day when you're in heaven, you'll see them. We'll meet them. But they died in the desert. They were not allowed to go into the promised land. See, the promised land has a different significance. And I've been talking about that over the last few weeks. If, uh, if you want more on that, uh, on chapters 1 through 6, we have some of the the CDs for the messages available over there in the bookstore. Nevertheless, look at this. God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, this is the verse that I wanted you to see, verse 6. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And this is what, as you recall, this is what they experienced. This is what happened. In Jericho with Achan, they set their hearts on, on evil things. And then he says in verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Verse 8, We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did. And, we were killed by, and they were killed by snakes. And do not grumble. So in a matter of... Three or four, four verses, he said, don't commit sexual immorality. Um, don't test the Lord. Uh, don't grumble. 
uh, there's instructions for us today. So you see here that we, we as believers, and I think this goes to a, um, a word that God gave to us. God spoke to me clearly on Tuesday night at our Bible study. There was a moment of, of silence, longer, <laughs> longer silence that we're used to in those meetings. And I heard God speak so clearly. And the word was this. It was no more business as usual. People, I, I want to encourage you strongly. I, I want to encourage you so strongly that maybe, maybe my encouragement will, will be bordering on offensive. And I, but I don't mean to offend. We've got to wake up as the body of Christ. We've got to become students of the Word of God and doers of the Word of God. You know, there's books, I'm ashamed to say, there's books in the Bible I haven't even read yet. I've been a Christian for 30 years. But as I'm reading Joshua, God is transforming my life because it's speaking to my condition. There were things that I just was not clear on regarding what the possession, what is the possession of the land for us? I didn't, I, I didn't have the foggiest notion. And so we're experiencing all of these frustrations in the Christian life. We're wondering where God is. Has He checked out on us? And Maybe you've been a Christian for a while. And um, you remember the early days when you came to the Lord. There seemed to be just abundant grace and things just kind of seemed to flow and come together. The manna came, the quail, God showed up, there was the pillar, there was the cloud, and it just seemed to be different. But now the nation is crossing over into the land. We also come to a point where God says, it's time now to put feet to your faith. It's no longer enough to just believe these things. It's not enough to just kind of step out of your tent in the morning and just kind of go yawn and just expect that the man is going to fall and the quail are going to fall. Listen, almost immediately from the time they went across the Jordan, the manna stopped. The quail stopped. No more pillar of fire by night. No more cloud during the day. Now it was different. And imagine, I mean, if you were there, you know, part of the nation of Israel, you know, here three days into, you just crossed over and you come out, you're in the promised land, right? Promised land. It's got to be better than the desert, than the wilderness. And so you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get chocolate flavor manna now. The manna's going to come. You know, I'm going to have, you know, filet mignon manna or, you know, this is going to be the high-end stuff now. So you come out of your tent and you stretch and you yawn and, and there's no manna. There's no manna on the floor. And you're walking around, manna, 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 manna. Quail, quail, quail. It's, gotta, it's coming, it's coming. And, and three days go by and you're wondering where it is. And you're thinking, oh, maybe God has me on an extended three-day fast. You see, going into the land, going into the promised land now, they would have to work and exert faith in order to be nourished. That seems like, it seems paradoxical, doesn't it? I mean, now they're in the promised land, and now, now they've got to work the land. They've got to grow. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. And God says, I'm giving you all of these cities. They're all yours, but you've got to take them. You, you've got to fight. You've got to believe. Now, let me just kind of bring you up to the moment here because there's a significance to Jericho. There, Jericho is the first stronghold they come to, and it was, a, it was a double-walled city, we're told. There were two walls. And God gave them very specific instructions, you recall, for taking Jericho. He spoke to Joshua, and Joshua began to lead the people. And so the taking of Jericho was very unique. It was the way they took Jericho was not the way that they would take Ai. It was not the way that they would take any of the other walled cities. And by the way, overall, they had to overcome 31 kings to take the land. Each one was different. Now, I'm just going to give you a little taste of chapter 8 and 9 because I'm not going to cover principally chapter 8 and 9. I'm just going to brush on it a little bit. 
just slightly. But there were two things that they did wrong in their campaigns to take the land that have absolute critical and vital application to us. In fact, the taking of Ai and then the deception by the the men of, I believe it's Gideon in chapter 9, I don't, want to, I don't want to misquote that. I want to make sure that I get that right. There's a deception that occurs. Gibeonite, I'm sorry. The Gibeonite deception. What was the problem in AI? Why did they fail in AI? In a nutshell. Sin. But they didn't hear the Word of God. They didn't hear the Word of God. In the Gibeonite deception, as you will read later and find out, their sin... God told them was they did not seek the counsel of the Lord. And these men come and they appear and they fool Joshua. They, they offer Joshua a deal. You know, they, they pretend that they're coming from a long distance away, that they were traveling from a great distance. And, and they, they fool Joshua into a treaty, into a pact to receive them and to allow them to remain in the land. And what was Joshua's failure there? Joshua did not seek the counsel of the Lord. Oh, this is major. And as I was reading chapter 9, I just thought of the many, many times when I have undertaken something. When When someone has come to me with a bright idea, a new business, a move, some significant thing or meeting that I had to have or something that I felt I had to say. And I failed to seek the counsel of the Lord. One of the greatest mistakes that I made in my life, in my business life, was not asking God for permission to do what I undertook. And boy, did I pay dearly. The Israelites would pay for a long time. In fact, they're still paying today for the Gibeonite deception. Because those people were allowed by Joshua, by the representative of God, to remain there. He signed a covenant with them. I'll go into that more in the future. But listen, here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. The problem in chapter 8 was not hearing the Word of God and acting on what they thought was right. The problem in God had already told told them how to take AI. So they didn't hear the word of God. And then in chapter 9, they didn't seek the counsel of the Lord. Are you looking to move? You feel that God has you moving out of Miami, like half of Miami that I know? You better make sure that that's in the counsel of God. You better make sure that that's right for you. Because if, if it's not what God has for you, you will learn some very difficult lessons. And oh, God won't miss the opportunity. God will not miss the opportunity. I can tell you from my own life, I had this great business opportunity. It started working really well. Money was flowing in. This is in the the years that I lived in Venezuela. It all looked wonderful. And I remember in the middle of that, somebody came to me, a Christian friend, and he said, Pastor, Pastor, uh, well, not Pastor Ralph. I wasn't a pastor then. He said, Ralph, I have a word for you. He knew that I was a Christian and I was a a leader in our church, an elder in our church. I have a word for you. Oh, really? Who are you to come? You know, that's what I'm thinking. Give me a word. I'm the can't you see how well this business is working? Just join us and make money. That's all you got to do. And I I recall today, I still remember my arrogance. And and just the way that I thought everything was going to work. And I just remember, you know, as I was reading chapter nine, I go, Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. I remember just thinking, and this, what this young man said to me, he said, you know, God, and it was so, it's so clear, I had completely forgotten. God is saying to you, pray about this. Be careful what you're getting into. You're treading on some very dangerous ground. And I remember looking at him and then looking at about a thousand people that I had gathered in this room with this business that was working so well. And just thinking, what a spoil sport. You know, and 
And I remember saying something to him that was, you know, that I thought that he was just being really negative. That he was coming at me with some stinking thinking. Now, the least that I could have done at that point is just prayed and said, God, is this you? But I didn't even do that. Because I was afraid that God was going to cause that thing to stop. See, I wanted God to go along with my plans. There is so much here that applies to us. And so, I feel that this is something that's historical. For the, We are at a historical moment. Not, not just as a, a local body, you know, Doral Vineyard, but the Church of Jesus Christ. And especially in this country. We've got to begin taking the Word of God and prayer seriously. We've got to start seeking the counsel of God in all of our decisions. The lessons are so clear. It jumps out as we read through Joshua. And I, I want to touch on, just briefly, on this tragedy of Achan. We're still in, let me finish reading 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 10, rather. 1 Corinthians 10. Oh, thank you, that's much better. Look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 11. These things, let's read this together. Would you read this out loud with me? These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Paul is saying, the things that happened to Israel were written as an example for them, but as warnings for us. He said, upon whom the what? End of the ages have come. We're the ones, if you're a follower of Jesus, the ends of the ages have come upon you. That's a real heavy thing. You ever stop to think about it? You know what that means? The fulfillment of the ages have come upon you. They haven't come upon those who are outside of Christ. They're still waiting for the end of the age. But if you've come to Christ, if you've come to the cross, if you've trusted in Jesus, all of the, all of the things that happen at the end of the age have come upon you already. Let me explain a little bit more on that. Because I think that's significant. You know, sometimes we pray for healing for people, and people get healed. And one of the most difficult things, by the way, who's been healed here recently in one meeting or another where God has healed you physically? At least two people. Was that during the Rendsburg's thing? You mean the thing that he prayed for you? The pallet was healed during the, 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 the when Rendsburg came to town? He had surgery for the pallet thing. If you guys were here that night, you remember Jorge had surgery. Uh, and he, he, was, he prayed for you, and you were healed. Praise God. And Berta, you were healed? You were healed that night too? Jose prayed for you, one of our own. It's good when we do it, and it works too, right? Somebody else was healed. I was talking to Laby's, uh, Laby's mom, Julia. She had a pain that she was prayed for that night. She could not bend over without feeling an excruciating, it was a sciatic nerve pain. I saw her yesterday. She's healed. God heals. One of the most mysterious things about healing and the gift of healing is that some are healed and some are not. Now, we're all supposed to continue praying and believing God. But you may, you may have a physical ailment. You wonder, why aren't you healed? I mean, I pray for a lot of people. I've, I've prayed, and there's been healings. And, but many times, I don't experience healing. I'm walking with aches and pains and so forth. Why? <coughs> why? Well, let me put it to you this way. In Christ, the fulfillment of the ages have come upon you. What happens at the end of the age? What happens at the end of the age? 
You ever read Isaiah 2? You ever read Isaiah 64? The passages that talk about the millennial reign of Christ? Kingdom reality. The kingdom reality is that you, at the resurrection, will be completely healed forever. Now, Paul describes us as those upon whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. What gets fulfilled at the end of the age? The kingdom. Jesus comes in its fullness. See, You see, in Christ, you are already healed. Your healing is, is a reality in Christ. See, you're physically here, but spiritually, you, are, you have been taken up to heavenly places in Christ. And in that place, in Christ, you are healed. That is as good as done. Because what God has promised, He guaranteed by the deposit of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the mystery of the kingdom. Remember what Jesus said about the kingdom and about the Holy Spirit? He comes. You don't know from when He comes. You don't know where He's going to come. The Holy Spirit is like a wind. He does what He desires. Now mysteriously, sometimes we pray... And He acts and He moves. And the Holy Spirit answers our prayers. So sometimes, the physical reality of the future breaks into the now. Sometimes, you as believers are experiencing kingdom realities. The presence of God, a miracle, a sign and a wonder. Now, you have already experienced judgment, by the way, if you're a Christian. The judgment that will happen at the end of the age, you've already been there. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It happened at the cross. It's so clear if you read through the Gospels. You remember what happened at the cross? There were earthquakes, there was darkness, the moon, the, the sun was not seen. The, there were earthquakes, and, the, and the, remember the dead rose? What was God trying to tell us with that? Is that at the cross, the presence of the future broke in completely. And so that when you come to the cross of Jesus, your sin is judged. Your sins are nailed to the cross. You will not have to fear all the terrible things that you read that will come upon the world in the book of Revelation. Those things, you will be spared. God will protect you. He will keep you. Because you have already been judged. Your sin was judged at the cross. He bore your sin. Past tense. The reason that people are healed is because there's an inbreaking of the kingdom. The inbreaking of the kingdom and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the authority of Jesus are the same thing. Remember in the book of Revelation? Chapter 12. That's why you got to read the Bible more. It said, now I come. Remember? Look at that. Rabbit trail number two. Then I heard a voice in heaven, verse 10, of chapter 12 of Revelation. Revelation 12. I heard a voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power of and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of His Christ. You see, at this point, John is seeing a vision of what happens at the end of the age when the Messiah returns to completely destroy evil, to destroy sin, to destroy death. But in Christ, we're experiencing those things already. Salvation, power, kingdom, they're all the same. You're you're saved because you have been brought into the kingdom from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His own dear Son. You're in the kingdom, experiencing the kingdom. Now, physical healing, we should never, ever lose heart in prayer because you don't know when God is going to say, now is the time. And the heavens open and the kingdom breaks in and God heals miraculously. Now, in the future, you will be healed completely. You will stand before God 100% healed 
with a new body, as a matter of fact, the Bible says. But these things were written for us as an example. Remember last week? I'm going to finish with this, with the tragedy of, of what happened to Achan, because I think this was so significant. I was going to move on, and God said, no, remain here for a reason. This is so important. Go back to Joshua 7. This is so vital. Please don't leave this place and let these things go. You know, we talk ourselves out of so much. We should stop talking when God stops talking. I think that's one of the reasons why, remember the last time around the walled city of Jericho, they had to do it in silence? I think I know why. Because if they had been allowed to talk, they would have talked themselves out of the last and final time around, and they would not have experienced the miracle of the walls of Jericho falling down. Because they would have been marching along, and you know, somebody would have said, hey, you know, Eliezer, this is crazy, man. We've been walking around. We, this is the seventh day now, and this is the seventh time, and I'm really tired, and nothing's happening. This is the most ridiculous siege of a city that I've ever heard of. And then all the grumbling and moaning and complaining would have started. And guess what? It would never have happened. We talk ourselves out of so many things. You know, sometimes God moves and speaks to you during a service, and he says, yes, do this, and, and give that, and be generous, and do that, and, and commit to tithe, and commit to giving. Speak to that person about Jesus. By the time you've gone home, you've talked yourself out of it. Look what he says in chapter 7. This is God speaking to, we read this last week, but I want to touch on it again. The Lord said to Joshua, what are you doing down on your face? Joshua, this was for chapter 6. Back then I wanted you on your face. Now it's not an issue of face. It's something else. You see, God doesn't want formulas. When we take as we take the promises, as we take the cities, as we take possessions of what we've already inherited, and this is what Joshua is all about, taking possession of what is already yours. It's yours, but you've got to take possession of it. As we take possessions, formulas will not do. There was a different strategy for every single city, for every single king that was brought down. God says this is not about a formula. You see, what God wants from us is relationship. Because the only way that we can discover what to do before a particular stronghold in our life or a walled city is to pray, is to ask Him. And how do you find Him? By His Word and by prayer. So here they are, this tragedy of Achan, and God is speaking to them. And He says, stand up. What are you doing on your face? Verse 11, Israel has sinned. Now, when you read in your Bible, Israel has sinned, you should underline that, mark it, because this is as an example and as a warning to us. Don't do what they did. You want victory in the Christian life? You want to take possession of every promise? You want to walk into the destiny that God has already designed for you? He has a destiny. He has plans to bless you and not hurt you. Eye has not seen or ear heard or has entered into the minds of men the things that God has prepared. Now, usually you hear that verse talked about as on the other side of the Jordan, way beyond. God wants to bless you now. Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. And they have put them with their own possessions. This is why the Israelites, listen. Are you going through a season of frustration? Or is, has there been a time in your life when this has happened and you're wondering, what is going on? Why is it that I don't seem to progress? Maybe, maybe, just maybe this applies to you. Maybe there's something that you have in your possession which is, is a devoted thing, which is God's, which needs to be given to God. For some of you, that, that means a tithe. That means giving to God regularly and sacrificially. 
Well, you say, I haven't tithed for my whole life, and nothing's ever happened to me. That's just it. Nothing's ever happened to you. Listen, this is a serious word. You say, well, I don't believe in that tithing business. That's Old Testament. Oh? Well, what is the New Testament reality of the Old Testament truth in Malachi? Tell me that. Or better put, how are you trusting God with your finances? How are you giving faithfully and sacrificially? How? Ask God that. They have stolen? <laughs> Compare that with Malachi 3 and 4. They have lied, and they have put them with their own possessions. Now, there's also a deeper meaning to that, and I talked about it in my letter. Jericho is a type of the world. You see, when Jesus comes at the end of the age, the book of Revelation talks about seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And at the end of the seventh bowl, the trumpet, the final trumpet sounds, and there's a shout from heaven, and the Lord appears. And when He appears, He comes to bring the kingdoms of this world down, and it will come suddenly. Jericho is a picture of the world. And so what does that speak to us now? Because there's a fulfillment then that was true. There's a fulfillment now that's true. And there's a fulfillment that's to come, which is true and literal. Jericho is the world. And God does not want us to covet the things of the world. Now, he already told Achan not to do, or the people of Israel that. They already knew that. They should have known that. They should have known that. You see, as I was asking myself, God was really mean in this chapter. You know, why didn't he... Look at the way he comes about this. Look at the way he goes about this. Look at chapter 7, verse... Well, let's, let's take it on with verse 12. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I underlined that. I said, God, have I been made liable to destruction in any way? Speak to me. That's a good prayer right there. You say, I don't need to pray that. Oh. Then get ready for the spiritual spanking because it's going to come. Because pride comes before the fall. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. He just wants to do what's good. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among, whatever among you is devoted to destruction. God, is there anything in my life devoted to destruction? Am I harboring something in me that's destroying me? Reveal that to me. Man, I have seen destructive habits and I have seen destructive patterns in people that people will just not let go because they're so identified with that that they think that they are that. You want to get rid of it? Nod your head. Say yes. <laughs> Take it out. Give it to God. And God said, how do you do that? Consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted is among you, O Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. Now, this is, when I, I read this, I, this is weird. God always has a reason. Look at verse 14. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Now, ask yourself a question at this point. That's why it's important just to dwell with Scripture. Don't blow by this kind of stuff. It's major. God, did God know who did this? Yes. Yes. Why didn't he simply just call it, say, Joshua? <clears throat> it's Achan. Achan has it under his tent. He's the guy. 
Why didn't he ask? Why didn't he say that? Why didn't he reveal that? Because God is merciful and gracious. You know what he was doing? He was giving Achan time to repent. Achan did not confess voluntarily. The Bible says in Numbers, I think it's 32, make sure your sin will find you out. You may be getting away with something now, and you're thinking, it's okay with God, and I've gotten away with it for a long time. I'm going on the Internet, checking out these websites. I'm having this affair. I'm dabbling, and I'm drinking too much. <laughs> had not done anything to me so far. I'm not tithing. I'm not being faithful with my... You don't say it that way to yourself, but that little voice inside of you does. Nothing's happened so far. So far, don't mistake inactivity on the part of God for his unwillingness to judge and chastise because he loves you too much to leave you. Why all this big drama? Why this big drama with God? His tribe was identified. His family finally, his household, and still Achan doesn't confess. Can you imagine the nerve on this guy? Was he hoping that somebody else would get blamed for it? He probably was. When I first read this, I go, wow, God sure was hard on that guy and his family. They all got stoned and burned and destroyed. What about Jericho? Poor old Jericho. You see, what we don't know and what is obvious is that God gave them years and centuries to repent and they would not. Don't interpret the fact that judgment has not come on our country with God's injustice or God's unwillingness to judge. America has no free ticket on judgment. We don't have a pass on judgment. Judgment is coming. It's only a matter of time until it comes. God will not turn His back on our, all of our sins as a nation, on our greed, on our self-centeredness on our lack of caring, God will not forget that. He won't. He cannot because He is just. He cannot change. He is God. He is just and He is loving. I think the Lord has that testimony for next week. Achan committed two evils. He took what was devoted to God and he stole from God. And the Lord told Joshua that there would be no victory for Israel until the camp had been searched out and judged. We were singing earlier, try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. You know what God loves to do? He loves to point out sin in your own life. You know what God doesn't like? When you point out sin in somebody else's life. That's judgment. Only God can judge. You think you have something to say to somebody about a sin in their life? Pray until you start weeping. Then go. With a lot of brokenness. There's some important things to consider here. I just want to touch on them quickly. God is a holy God. God is holy. Secondly, the more light we have, the more accountable we are. God revealed Himself to Achan over and over to Israel, he told them these things. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 21. This was old hat to Israel. Moses is telling them how they're going to drive out the nations, how they're going to be victorious. God says in verse 21 of Deuteronomy 7, do not be afraid of them, don't be terrified by them, for the Lord your God who is among you is great and awesome. God is with you. Don't be afraid of any AIs or Jerichos or any authorities or principalities in your life. Verse 22, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. Notice that. Little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once. That's true for you too. That nothing, All of those strongholds in your life won't fall all at once. Or the wild animals will multiply around you. God has reasons why not all the stuff is cleared out immediately. 
while there are still principalities and powers and thoughts and things that stand up against the knowledge of God. But they will come down, verse 23, but the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into great confusion until they're destroyed. He will give you the kings into your hand, and He will wipe out their names from under heaven. No one will be able to stand against you. You will destroy them. But here's the big but. The big but principle. Verse 25, But the images of their gods you are to burn in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold on them. Do not take it for yourselves, or you will be ensnared by it. For it is detestable to the Lord your God. Don't do anything. Don't buy anything. Don't get into anything because you covet. Because you want something as good. Because you want something that's prettier. Oh, how many ministries have fallen because of that just in the last six months? Big ministries. Good people that love God. Do not bring a detestable thing into your house or you, like it, will be set apart for destruction utterly abhor and detest it, for it is set apart for destruction. You think they would have gotten the message? They were clear. God even told them before that. In, in, in the previous chapter, you can read that later in, in, in Joshua 6.18. What's amazing is that in full light of this warning, Achan disobeys God. Third principle is beware of flagrant lying. Lying to God in his face, or lying to someone else. You know, is Achan just some Old Testament? Is this some Old Testament issue that goes away under grace? Oh, you're bringing out the fire and brimstone today, Pastor Ralph. We're under grace. Oh, yeah? Have you ever read Acts chapter 5? Ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira? They were severely judged by God. The Bible says in Acts 5.11, great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard about it. God forbid that we should ever have a fear of God that is holy and that drives us to holiness. We don't need less of that. We need more of that. We're on this end of the scale. We need to be over here somewhere. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Can it happen again? Yes, it can happen again. It can happen again. Principle five. I'm skipping over principle four. I'll read that next week. All of Israel sinned because of Achan's sin. It was just the sin of a man, but it became the sin of all. Because all we all have sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and come under the 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 judgment of God. All of us. We have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Look at Romans 3.10. Could you bring that one up? As it is written, there is no one righteous. Not even one. None of us are righteous. We're the Achan. Who's the Achan? I'm the Achan. I'm the Achan. But God has given us time to repent. You can come out of that tent before he gets to the family stage. Say, God, it's me. I've sinned. This is why God has provided a sacrifice. This is why he sent Jesus to die for our sins. The Bible says in John chapter 1, 1 John 1, 1, 9, it says, if you have sinned, you have an advocate with the Father. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But knowing that we're forgiven is not an excuse to continue living in sin. This is where I think the church today, where we get it wrong so often, we violate, we go against the grace of God. God loves us. He's going to discipline us if we sin. He'll forgive. He'll restore. Remember what happened in chapter 8, verse 1 of Joshua? They messed up the first time. But the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Take the whole army with you. Go up. Now do it right and attack Ai again. See, the problem is we fall into discouragement because of conviction, because of our unconfessed sin. And so the enemy's got us before we can even be a threat at the next stage of our life. 
He uses that discouragement to destroy us. I want to just finish with this encouragement and tell you that you know, most of your battles are still ahead. Most of our battles are still ahead. Joshua 13, he says to Joshua, you are very old, Joshua, and there's still much land to be taken. That's true for you. It's true for me. It's true for us as a church. But we need to learn from those who went before us. We need to learn from our, their failures. We need to follow their faith. And we need to repeat their victories. This is really the last verse now. Truly. Anybody got a Bible? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. One of the things that the Lord was speaking to me is that He is calling us to a warrior spirit. For too long, we've had a defeated spirit as a church, as a people. And he's calling his people to rise up as warriors. Let God judge your sin. Bring it before him. Bring it out in the open to God. Tell him, Lord, you're right. I've hidden this thing. I've got it. I'm the Achan. Forgive me. I don't want to hold what's yours. I want to begin to believe and move by faith on the Word of God. I love this charge that Paul gives to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. In the presence of God, chapter 4, verse 1, and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit to their own desires. To suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This is a great problem in the church in America today. Oh, I don't like that the pastor brought up that verse. I'm going to go where they never talk about that. I don't want to hear about sin. I don't want to hear about the cross. I don't want to hear about blood. Christianity is a happy religion. Happy, happy, happy. Grace, grace, grace. Manna, manna, manna. Quail, quail, quail. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, but you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I, look at this, I am being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Look at this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, which He will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all those who have longed for His appearing. Fight the good fight. You know what the goal is? To be standing at the end with a dented helmet and a bloody sword and scruffed up knees. But to be standing. I'm calling you this morning to fight for your destiny. For, to fight for your spiritual destiny. I'm challenging you with that today. Maybe you've given up on a loved one. You walked around, man, I prayed for this person so many times. Is God going to, my healing and my finances, and man, oh man, oh man. Watch out, the wall's coming down. You see, what's true for them is true for us. Don't give up before you go that seventh time around. Because the Lord will blow the trumpet. And that part of your life, that issue, that person, that child, that career situation, God's going to take out the shofar in heaven and blow it.
That was God. And it's going to come down. Because everything that hasn't bowed the knee to Jesus will come down. In your life and in the world, don't give up. Don't be afraid. Don't cower before the enemy. He's afraid of you. He's afraid the moment you bend your knees to call upon the Lord. But go from this place and let God search you. Don't be afraid of what he's going to reveal. What, are the, what am I holding on to, God? What are the detestable things? Search me and try me.